Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about a subject that is on everybody's mind that is waiting for a transplant, has a transplant, and how do you how do you keep yourself healthy with this COVID-19 crisis? And today we're talking to Dr. Rafael Villacana, who's the medical director of the kidney transplant program at Loma Linda University. And we're we're very excited to have you here again, Dr. V. You are our resident uh, uh, transplant expert. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. It's uh, great to be back. Uh, um, we've spoken so many times over the years, but obviously this will be a special topic under special conditions as as we know them right now. Well, and, you know, can you just explain a little bit of, between the difference of a pulmonary flu and the coronavirus? I, I'm hearing a lot of things out there. Well, this is just like the flu. Please explain. Yeah, I, I, those were the comments, I think, that were people were saying a couple months ago. Unfortunately, there is some overlap, of course, in terms of the symptoms that one might um, get with the traditional flu or influenza, but it's obviously looking to be a little bit more aggressive than advertised, um, and uh, it's clearly not not playing out that way. Well, and it, you know, you you have the symptoms because it it is like the flu and a cold that attacks your lungs. But uh, what's so frightening to me as a transplant recipient, that's why I am doing everything possible not to be even at risk of catching it, staying safe at home, wearing masks, hand sanitizers, being very careful. Um, I've only been out like twice for a drive in the last six weeks. I mean, I'm really being precautious. Wow. And uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm immune compromised and it's my fourth transplant and I have some pulmonary issues. So I don't really have any room for error, do I? <laughs> no, unfortunately, um you know, you're right that uh, based on what you just mentioned, that you definitely um, you are definitely at risk for um, COVID-19, as many of us are. Um, but uh, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, as the um, session goes further. But we'll talk about special things that uh, someone who's received a transplant, let alone a fourth transplant. Can you believe that? Um, that might be uh, seeing in your day to day life. Well, and transplant recipients are at greater risk because we just take medication every day to suppress our immune system, <laughs> and we need that to keep our transplant. Absolutely. What's kind of come up quite a bit is, um, both formally and informally, is how to manage um, the medications, the transplant medications, uh, to make sure you're, you're not more at risk for uh, having the infection, and if you do have the infection, how to manage those medications as well that we can get into. So have you come across a lot of transplant recipients or experienced uh, COVID-19? Have they been diagnosed with it? I'm I'm really curious to know how, how it's going. So knock on wood, um, you know, and please remember that we're a little bit further from the city. Uh, we're probably about 60 miles uh, due east of downtown Los Angeles. So um, we've seen very little of it um, that we know of. Um, which is a key, right, that we know of. Because, as you know, testing isn't as widespread as it should be and as much as we would like. But uh, very few cases uh, of this um, in our program, thankfully. Well, and you'd mentioned a comment earlier on um, that we, we didn't record, but you used the term supercarrier. And, and can you explain what that is? Because I've been hearing that term a little bit more and more. Not exactly yes. sure what it means. So th- these uh, individuals are usually um, or are going to be asymptomatic. As you know, there's quite a few people with the virus, the COVID-19, that don't exhibit any symptoms. They tend to be a little bit younger, and they're, they've been shown, especially in other countries, that uh, they could uh, spread this virus to numerous people without uh, anyone knowing until it's after the fact. And then they, the epidemiologists, is that right? They track it back to that one carrier. Like, they're like detectives. It's amazing how they they figure it out, isn't it? It's it's they like, oh, that person started the whole spread. Is that how they, they find it? 
that's exactly how that is, and it's especially in other countries that uh, unfortunately were affected by this earlier, and they seem to have have gotten this down quite a bit. I would say detective is is a great word for that. Well, and you know, I've been hearing a little bit more about you know some of my peers who have a transplant, like you know, should they go get their blood drawn? I know for me, um, I am making sure I'm ahead of getting my medicines. Like I don't need to wait till the last four or five days. I need to get them as soon as I can so I don't have to rush or, uh, you know, be at risk of not having a good supply of medication. And some of the pharmacies luckily have allowed a 90-day supply. So I try to get that whenever I can too. No, you're right. Um, we're trying to do more mail order um, trying to do more 90 days instead of 30 days uh, in terms of having to go to the pharmacy because each touch point that you go outside, whether it's to the laboratory, to the pharmacy, to the doctor's office, all those events can pose a risk. So uh, I'm glad to hear that you're um, already on top of that from the pharmacy perspective. You mentioned uh, lab draws. We are also trying to minimize the amount of uh, lab draws that are done after surgery. But they still need to be done, as you know, and so that's still happening. There are some uh, groups that we partner with uh, these days that are actually offering the ability to have a mobile phlebotomy or a home uh, phlebotomist goes to your house, gets uh, gets your test done, and then uh, drops them off at the lab. Have you heard of that yet? I have. Um, I'm not due for labs. I just had them, luckily, the end of February. Uh, oh, perfect. But, I, but, yeah, I'm considering it, you know, because I really don't want to put myself at risk. And uh, all they have to tell me is they have good blood drawers because I'm not an easy stick. And, uh, you know, that would make all the difference in the world. So if they can, they can ensure me that they have people who are very, very seasoned, I'm in. <laughs> no, that's a great point. I'm glad you said that about the um, being a hard stick because, as you know, many people who've had a kidney transplant have been on dialysis. Unfortunately, they're known to, to say that they're, they're a difficult stick. So that's, that's a good point, especially when we, as a team, think about offering this to someone. That's probably the first thing I should ask. But uh, thanks for the reminder. Well, and you know, for me too, the thing that helps me be an easier stick is to make sure I've got enough fluid in me um, and make, you know, because if it's in the morning and um, I can drink some water and stuff like that to make sure there's all these little tricks you have to do. And uh, where I go get my labs at um, Cedar sinai I, uh, the one gentleman there, <laughs> he is just like, he's like a miracle worker. He has never, ever stuck me twice, ever. I don't know how he does it, but there is a real gift in drawing blood, and he has it. That's for sure. <laughs> I remember him from my time there. Uh, you know he's who I'm talking well about. Yes, I know, exactly. I know. I'm like, <laughs> the guy has got like ultrasonic eyes to be able to see the little vein and be able to get every ounce of blood out. And he like one time he did like, there was like 18 tubes laying there, and I'm like, you're going to get all that blood out of me? And he's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and I'm like, and he delivered. So um, That's right. <laughs> these are the heroes that we don't often see that make our life so easy. And when, when, when they get it wrong, then we yell. We never, we never say, oh, my God, you are so wonderful. We only, we only say when somebody gets it wrong. Well, um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, have you had a situation where one of a patient or you've heard of some of your colleagues that – you know, they are sick. And I mean, there's sometimes that the, these tests can be false sometimes that we haven't really gotten the testing down a hundred percent to know if it's, if it's accurate. I've heard some of that in the news. Is that a concern? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's a big concern. Although thankfully, as more tests are getting online, um, I think the accuracy is getting a little bit better. But some of those, uh, especially the swabs, those are difficult uh, sometimes because it, it also depends on the the way the swab was collected, as you may have heard, and it's not very comfortable to get a swab test. So I think uh, sometimes the accuracy is, is a little bit less than it should be because the sample maybe wasn't deep enough or it wasn't in the right area. But uh, you'll definitely hear accuracy um, as low as 60%. Oh wow! And uh, and uh, obviously higher uh, with other uh, uh, types of tests, but I believe it's getting better. Uh, but if you have someone, or if you know someone that really thinks they have it, and they were checked once and it was negative, um, they may merit a second test just to double check, uh, because as you mentioned, there are some cases of of it not 
being correct. Um, and it truly was uh, positive. On the flip side, though, if the test comes out positive, I guess the good news would is that it's accurate, that or it's accurate. pretty accurate for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to go back to the blood draws a little bit, because um, when I get my blood drawn, uh, there are a couple of things that's really important, because I don't want people who are listening who have a transplant say, oh, I've been fine. I don't need to get my blood drawn. Uh, there's certain things you look for in medication management. And maybe, you know, go through a few of those things because the medications affect our white count, um, different aspects of um, that you, you you will know if we're either under immune suppressed or over immune suppressed. And we certainly don't want to be over immune suppressed right now. No, great point. As a matter of fact, I just did a full morning of, of course, video visits these days. And there were a few individuals with, with certain issues that I hadn't or wouldn't have been able to pick up if it wasn't for them going to the laboratory as, as they normally do. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, just going by on the simple test, uh, the CBC, it could tell us if the white count is a little bit low, if someone is on a little bit too much medication, is your cell sub too strong. Um, prograph levels, of course, are, are measured for those that are on it, or cyclosporin for the fewer patients who are, who are on it, that as well, we measure that. Obviously, uh, there's a serum creatinine that's included in the panel that tells us how the kidney's doing, the urine obviously tells a lot as well. So all these things that aren't necessarily obvious, like based on how one is feeling, or if I see you in person or online, I may not be able to pick up unless uh, someone is able to go to the lab, as you mentioned earlier. And, And I've heard of situations where, you know, people have gained weight or lost weight. And this is particularly important for them to get tested more because it's going to affect their medication. Exactly. Um, there's quite a bit of weight fluctuations going on these days, especially with the quarantine. Unfortunately, for many of us, it's going in the wrong direction. But uh, yes, there there are things that are that are weight based, and um, and it is good to make sure that uh, one is not seeing too much or too little of a of a certain medication these days. I'm going to segue a little bit about into the general public and transplantation. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on in the community for a person who has a transplant and they catch COVID-19? What's happening? Um, Do they have to stop their immunosuppressant drugs or do they just fight it? Uh, I'm just a little scared. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Great, great question. And this is something, especially at the very beginning when, what was it, maybe six weeks ago when this was starting to dawn on our country that this was really happening to us as well. We leaned on quite a bit on the um, the international experience from China, from Italy, Europe, and then unfortunately more experience in, in the East Coast and other parts of the country. But uh, the short answer is that if uh, some a patient who's had a transplant gets COVID-19, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all hospitalized, number one, which is good. Some are able to just, just to quarantine at home and uh, recover uh, successfully. For those that are admitted to the hospital, we don't necessarily stop all the medicines. There may be some uh, mild to medium adjustments of the medicines, but we don't uh, try not to stop all of them because obviously uh, rejection is still a real risk. If someone who's really sick, however, maybe in the intensive care unit, then maybe more uh, considerable reductions of medicine uh, is done as well. But at the same time, again, trying to maintain some medication also to uh, preserve the graft if possible. Well, and it's uh, that's actually really refreshing to hear because I'm thinking, wow, um, I heard some of the experiences in Italy that uh, they were having problems with um, too many people getting sick at once. That's why we were all trying to stay home and flatten the curve. And they had so many people coming to the hospital sick that they had reports saying they weren't tubing transplant patient, cancer patients, or diabetic patients. And that came back to like... Wow, because they had so many people, they knew that diabetic cancer patients and transplant patients wouldn't fare as well as somebody who didn't, and they had to make that choice. And, you know, tubing is uh, being put on a vent. So those patients didn't survive. They didn't get the option to go to a vent because they didn't have enough supply. And I think that's why everybody's kind of scrambling in the U.S. to make sure that they have enough vents and all the different things that... Uh, at their disposal uh, to be able to help somebody who may have COVID-19 and a big influx of patients. You're absolutely right, especially the uh, European experience uh, was uh, pretty alarming. And um, luckily, at least uh, in 
my region where, where I'm at, that hasn't uh, come into play yet. And as far as I know, it hasn't really uh, very much in the in the Northeast, which has been hit pretty hard as well. But uh, you're right that there there was that type of um, kind of thought process that was going on in, in other countries, but uh, has not uh, hit this country yet. As I mentioned, it does appear, at least in some regions, that the curve is being flattened. Well, and when I heard that on March 6th, I decided to stay home. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I think I'm staying home till we know more about this badass virus. I mean, because it is, that's my new name for it. I don't like COVID-19. It's just a badass virus. Um, it, it really is. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I want to switch gears a little bit because a lot of people are waiting for a kidney transplant. And, you know, what has been your protocol and and those you've seen around the country? uh, How do you, you know, how do you protect yourself? Are you still giving transplants? And is it, you know, pretty much the same uh, as it's always been? Or has it been impacted by this badass virus? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so this uh, badass virus has uh, obviously (laughs) altered some of our approaches to, to uh, people who either want a kidney or are already on the list for a kidney. So the answer is, thankfully, we are doing transplants. We never completely um, halted them altogether, although there were a few weeks where they were uh, greatly reduced, as you can imagine, as we wanted to see what was happening and uh, making sure everybody was safe and uh, resources were used uh, appropriately. But uh, transplants are still happening. I would also say that they appear to be increasing kind of back towards pre-COVID-19 levels, but they're not there yet. That might take some time, but things are still happening. Transplants are still occurring. We are seeing people um, via Zoom or online um, who want a transplant or who are already on our list and making sure that they're still healthy enough to accept a transplant. So um, that's still happening. Is it impacting um, living donors or are those still uh, taking place? Great comment, and unfortunately, it did affect living donors. Um, we uh, haven't really done one for uh, over a month, um, but uh, we are talking about getting that back online. Uh, but that was probably one of the first things that that did have to be halted was because that could be considered a, a procedure that could be, you know, moved around, rescheduled. Whereas um, a kidney from a deceased donor, obviously, that can't really wait. So that's kind of why that that carried on. If the deceased donor has COVID-19, are they a candidate? So at this time, the the answer is no. Um, They are not a candidate to be a donor. I've not heard of any type of transplant that occurred with that type of donor, at least knowingly, uh, anywhere in in the world. But um, in the earlier days, and you mentioned, it's funny you said March 6th, because that's roughly about six weeks ago. People didn't really know how to check the donors. There, there weren't really any um, kits really available uh, to do that. And now that there are, all donors are checked at least once, sometimes twice. They're being checked, um, just so that everybody knows. Um, they, they are being checked. And uh, anyone who wants to get a kidney transplant, when they check in, they get a, a quick uh, COVID-19 screen as well to make sure that they're negative uh, going into this. Okay, because it's it is it's um, and the testing's much faster now because obviously a transplant takes place with a deceased donor within what is it thirty six hours, um, preferably within twenty four hours. But you're right, it could it could sometimes be in the thirties. Yeah, before I mean, it's better to have it the sooner the better, right? But absolutely. Um, but uh, what do you have enough time to turn the test around? Because I've heard there's been days to get the test back. Oh, you're right. Um, at the, in March, it was not unusual for it to be up to a week uh, delay for that. But at least in our region, over the last couple of weeks, we have um, a, the the quick test that is within 10 to 15 minutes, you will have a result. A lot of donors come from situations where they got into an accident or, you know, drunk drivers out there. And it's it's really sad, but that's how a lot of donors come uh, to be uh, candidates. And are you seeing a decrease in that because everybody's safe at home? <laughs> you know, th- that there's a little bit of that. You're, you're right. Um, it's already been well established that there's less uh, accidents and uh, fatalities as people are trying to stay at home and stay off the roads. But uh, there are still uh, donors out there. Our uh, local OPO is working very hard to try to identify these donors and have conversations with uh, families, which isn't the easiest time right now, because as you know, in the hospitals, 
um, there there are really no visitors allowed. So right. it, it kind of adds another uh, barrier at the moment. Well, and I know when I'm like cutting vegetables, because that's all I seem to do is cut fruits and vegetables anymore. I'm like like this, <laughs> like, it, it, and I have these really sharp cutco knives. And every time I'm cutting them, I'm like, I'm extra careful because I'm like, I cannot afford to cut myself right now. <laughs> oh, whatever I do, I don't, you know, anything that has any risk, I'm like, Lori, you can't do that because you can't go to the hospital at all. You can't get sick at all. And um, we've all been washing our hands so much. And uh, I started to get this really bad hangnail on my thumb. And I'm like, I mean, you would think that like I have gauze around it. I have, you know, antimicrobial, uh, you know, cream and a Band-Aid because I'm like, that could be, turn into a massive infection for me if I don't take care of it. So I've been a little paranoid lately, even um, uh, like what can make me sick. And I got to make sure I don't do anything to even risk it. I'm even more hypersensitive to it now. No, I think you're doing the right thing. And you probably read in the paper, seen in the news that uh, visits to urgent cares and emergency rooms are, are markedly down um, for numerous reasons, but people really just don't want to be in that environment with good reason at the moment. But at the same time, uh, for those that are listening, obviously, if you're not feeling good or if you know, you're know you asked to, be, to go to the emergency room by your uh, medical team, please do so because it, it could be worse uh, by not uh, checking in and... Uh, you know, you might have an infection or something that really uh, needs uh, more urgent attention. Well, and I've had that situation because I've had um, UTIs. Uh, transplant recipients don't often show high fevers, right? We kind of, because we're immune suppressed, it suppresses our fever sometimes. Isn't that right? That's what I was told. No, it's absolutely right. And that's, ex- that's exactly what I was thinking, uh, a urinary infection, when I men- made my prior comment because those do tend to happen a little bit more in those that received a, a kidney transplant. But one thing that, uh, since you mentioned uh, the lack of a fever or maybe not as high of a fever, that's also been uh, observed in uh, transplant recipients who have had COVID-19. So um, just because you don't necessarily have a fever, that doesn't mean you don't have or that it could not be due to COVID-19. That's a good uh, good comment there. Well, and, you know, I, I w- a few years back I had a... a urinary, tra- I had like, a, I think it was E. coli. It was something that I, I end up having to have um, IV infusion to get rid of it. Uh, none of the antibiotics were working for it. And I don't become symptomatic with UTIs. Uh, but I wasn't feeling very good and just just not exactly right. And, you know, Christ went and got it tested. And of course, I had this UTI, but um, I had just like a t- teeny tiny fever like nothing um, abnormal, just a couple of points up, which wouldn't give anybody alarm if they didn't know that my, you know, what my normal temperature is. So um, that's one of the things people have to really be on top of is knowing what your body temperature normally runs when, <laughs> uh, because mine runs a little lower than it used to run. It's it's very strange. Maybe I'm becoming more reptilian or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do love animals. <laughs> well, that's right. They're rubbing off on me. I, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah. it. I, exactly. Um, so that's that's probably the reason. So, um, any other tips that um, you give to people who you know are trying to prevent? Um, I, I don't think people can hear it enough uh, because uh, their risk for getting COVID nineteen. Well, I think a lot of what you mentioned uh, in this uh, last thirty minutes, uh, even what you're doing, is uh, re- really uh, helpful in in lowering your risk of, of having this uh, virus or other infections in general. And I think is staying home as much as you can, minimize, you know, any uh, visits um, to wherever you need to go. And it was a great idea about the 90-day supply for the pharmacy. Um, all those things are important, social distancing, washing your hands, all those things that everybody's heard um, quite a bit. But I think another important thing, and in, in we just kind of touched on it, is also don't ignore your body. If you're not feeling good, if something's not right, and as you mentioned, everyone knows their internal uh, body and maybe their internal temperature, those those things are important. So if things aren't right, please try to get some attention. At minimum, try to um, set up a video visit with your transplant team to go over your symptoms to make sure that it's nothing serious or that's something that could be dealt with, um, you know, over video, over the phone, with with something that with some remedy at home. 
Well, I have to tell you, I am so excited about the video visits because <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I love to go to clinic and see everybody, but I hate sitting there for hours. So um, I imagine some people are very, very happy about that, uh, that we oh, yeah. can just um, sign on and see the doctor and we can be you know, playing on our computer, doing work. And ha- have you have you seen that that's um, increased your productivity as a organization? I mean, it's certainly improved the patient's productivity. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think it it's something that our patients do seem to like. For our staff, it's a lot of work, as you can imagine, to set this up, especially for individuals who've had a transplant and not very comfortable or savvy with uh, computers or online applications of of downloading this or that. I think it takes some getting used to, but I think once it, it goes well, it, it really can go very well. And the day moves uh, more quickly for, I think, for both parties. Well, and I think what we're going to see when this badass virus is gone, that <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to probably, um, you know, continue with a lot of these policies because it doesn't make any sense for somebody to drive you know, 30 miles for a visit that could happen over the over a video conference. Having said that, though, I was on a, a national call recently, and they were, you know, changing reimbursement for um, visits, telemedicine. And um, I was lucky to get the language in there. But I said, you know, sometimes you can't, you're not able to get a video visit because the patient doesn't have the technology available, but we should never fall back on phone visits. I mean, that should be an, a last resort because, you know, you have to see us. You have to, you know, have that physical uh, ability to see people. And then the other things that, you know, worry me about a virtual visit is that, you know, are we weighing right? I mean, because I can't really fudge the weight when I go to clinic. I'm like, I'm like, come <laughs> on, let me take another show off. Let me take another one off. Um, and, you know, there's certain things that we're going to have to do ourselves. And we have to make sure that we report accurately to the doctor, which, you know, when you're in the clinic, you, can, you can't get away with that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, G- great point. Um, so the telemedicine, I think, is, as you mentioned, a, a really good option for the majority of, of individuals. I could see where maybe we could alternate, whether it could be a video visit and then a physical visit and et cetera. I think that that could work uh, as well, and especially those that live uh, far. Uh, there's a lot of traffic, obviously, in Southern California. I think we should all factor that in. But uh, you're right. We'll, we'll be relying on everyone and what their blood pressures are saying and what their weight is saying at home. But uh, I think for a short period, that, that, that'll work very well. Well, and, you know, one of the things that I think is important, and I've done this before, is if you have somebody else in your family or, you know, get an extra blood pressure cuff if you can to validate your blood pressure cuff, because sometimes the blood pressure cuffs aren't accurate. And, uh, um, you know, I don't know exactly how to how to stress how important that is. I've taken my blood pressure cuff and taken it into the doctor's office and seeing if they get the same reading. Because uh, sometimes there's a little error in those little portable devices, or you don't put the cuff on right, or something like that. And and blood pressure is so crucial to keeping your kidney transplant healthy. Like maintaining a normal blood pressure is is uh, one of the top top uh, things you need to do. And no, absolutely. The blood pressure is really uh, key. And also, it's also kind of an earlier hint if maybe there's a, a concern that maybe we should be digging uh, more deeply and looking at um, more tests and uh, things of that nature. But you're right, there's very variability, and to try to maybe validate it with the second uh, cuff would be a, a good idea. Yeah, it's um, and you can't find a thermometer, um, I mean, to save your life right now. Um, so hopefully people have it. And, you know, the other thing I have on hand that I'm glad I have, you can't find them either, but I have a little pulse oximeter, uh, that I have had since I've had pulmonary complications, and and I think that's if, if you have the ability to get one of those pulse oximeters that put on your finger, it would be a good tool to be able to um, tell your healthcare team what your um, oxygen levels at, because uh, that would help if you get sick with COVID nineteen for sure. No, you're right, and those are really scarce. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was actually at a pharmacy and kind of browsing and looking for that. I didn't find any or a thermometer, but there were blood pressure cuffs. So, uh, 
At least uh, there's no no excuse for that these days. I know it's uh, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. We wish we would have bought all this earlier, but um, it's. Uh, I know I actually went into my art supply stash, and I found two N95 masks. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm rich Um, because I was painting some, you know, some craft project and it required this mask. And I'm like, well, I'm I I have it there in case I need it. I haven't used it. I feel kind of guilty. I feel like I should give it to a healthcare professional. Uh, But then I'm thinking, well, I may really need it. I did give two away because I had uh, another box because I have multiple crafts. So. You know, um, it's it's a scary time. I I think we need to do everything we can um, as patients. And, and the other thing I think I really want to just wrap this up with, but how important it is to manage your emotional well-being during any stage you are of kidney disease, because that impacts your overall health. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But um, do you want to just mention how important that is? Oh, it's really important. As a matter of fact, just this morning, I, I did a, a video consultation with with an individual who was feeling a bit down about being in the house. It's already we're going on well over a month, and they didn't they didn't really see this getting better. And it's important to kind of maintain um, kind of your spirits up because that does affect. Uh, your health, but it's, uh, it sounds simple, but it, it really, it really is just that simple. If you're not feeling good, if you're not in the right mood, you may skip medications here and there, be a little bit forgetful, and just not care as much as you normally would otherwise. But, uh, do know that things are hopefully going to get better. We'll all eventually be out and about, maybe in a different way, but uh, things will get better. And you're right, uh, trying to maintain a, a good attitude is, is super key. Well, and we're so lucky because we have so many options of things to do on the internet. Um, RSN, you know, we're ha- we have online support groups going on. We have a huge support group. We have uh, exercise classes four times a week that we're offering on Zoom. Uh, I know how hard it is. We did one um, Zoom class. I think we're going to do a- another one called Get Creative. And about 15 of us were all on Zoom talking about creative projects that we're doing and inspiring each other. So um, I'm a big believer if you want something, you go out and create it. So if you're feeling like you're feeling down or something, go out and try to make somebody else happy and um, or give them an encouraging world and you'll feel better. Uh, and uh, try to c- create that community um, because we're so lucky to have the cloud that we're all living in right now and dancing on and doing all our social events <laughs> in the cloud now. But uh, I can't imagine what it would be like, you know, 100 years ago when they had that great flu. They didn't even really have – they didn't have Netflix back then either. So <laughs> I, I don't know um, how they got by in 1918 when they were all sequestered and quarantined and, you know, um, they didn't have much. <laughs> We have a lot. Now we do. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Villacana, for your expertise and knowledge. And, you know, you made me feel a lot better because um, uh, I've, I've read some of the information. I'm a little afraid to dig too deep because of, of the stories I heard. But it's nice to know that, you know, there is recovery with transplant recipients. You do have a higher risk, uh, that transplants are still happening. And, uh, you know, life goes on and, you know, we'll get through this and it'll remind us of, uh, you know, you don't know what you have till you don't have it. And I think the fact that uh, we're going to appreciate, you know, going out, giving hugs, going to the beach, being around other people much more when we get back to normal. Absolutely. And thanks for the invitation. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.